roughly 3.5 million years ago, Lucy, Australopithecus afarensis, one of the most important fossils ever found, roamed the African savanna. Today, using the latest scientific research, we're going to reconstruct her life and her death as much as we possibly can, from the terrible danger she would have faced to her greatest moments and perhaps even the first glimpses of what makes us truly human. This is life and death three million years ago. Lucy's life began in the same way as all life does, with a bang. She was born into a world that was in many ways familiar to ours but in some ways vastly different. Millions of years before our species had scarred the planet, this was a wild world teeming with life. Some we would recognize as the ancestors of modern animals. Others would be quite different, like Therapithecus brumpti, a relative of the gelata but twice the size, weighing up to 50 kilograms. Likely, it preferred to eat plants, but you wouldn't catch me getting in the way of one. Megantyrian, saber-toothed cats built like a leopard on steroids, had huge teeth and strong jaws to bring down the largest of prey. Perhaps most dangerous of all were crocodiles, with many more species than we have now lurking hidden in the water. For a young Australopithecus like Lucy, life was far from guaranteed, and the archaeological record is full of examples of our ancient ancestors falling prey to these beasts. A Paranthropus, a robust Australopithecus, had two puncture marks in the skull, probably caused by a leopard, dragged across the savanna by the skull, a horrible way to go. The bones of thirsty Australopiths were peppered with the puncture marks of crocodile teeth, no doubt caught off guard as they went for a drink and ripped from the water's edge by a crocodile lying in wait. Saddest of all was perhaps the small tong child, a roughly three-year-old Australopithecus africanus that lived around 2.8 million years ago. Judging by the marks on the insides of their eye sockets, they were seemingly plucked from the savanna by a predatory bird, probably an African crowned eagle, and carried away to a grisly end. Lucy, however, survived these challenges, possibly by spending a lot of time still in the trees. Although we're confident Lucy was bipedal from her short and wide hip, a fully extendable knee and many other anatomical features, her upper body, and the upper bodies of other afarensis hominins, are more complicated, seemingly retaining many more ape-like features. In 2012, anthropologists found the intact shoulder blade of a young Australopithecus afarensis, which they called Selam. This was a critical discovery because even though Lucy is 40% complete, her shoulder blades are missing, denying us a crucial piece of the anatomical puzzle. Selam's shoulder blades were much more similar to modern juvenile gorillas than modern humans, suggesting that some of their time was still being spent in trees. However, it is also possible that these were archaic features that Australopiths retained from our last common ancestor with chimpanzees and that they served little practical purpose, changing very slowly due to a lack of strong evolutionary pressures. Apart from avoiding becoming lunch, Lucy's childhood was probably similar to modern great apes playing with other kids, rolling around in the grass, jumping on her siblings, watching the adults in her group, and learning the skills she would need to survive. Consistently, the greatest challenge Lucy would have faced was finding food. Analysis of the teeth of 20 different Australopithecus afarensis individuals indicates that their diet involved a lot of C4 plants. These are grasses, sedges, and succulents, the kinds of plants that thrive in a dry, open savanna environment. They could have been eating the grasses and seeds themselves or possibly the roots and tubers, which are much higher in calories. Because of their inaccessibility, competition for these buried foods was rare, and they could have provided a decent meal for an Australopith smart enough to dig for them. These foods are almost entirely avoided by our closest relatives, chimpanzees and gorillas, and this change of diet marks a significant moment in the direction of our evolution away from the resources of the forest and toward the more varied resources of open landscapes. Just because this food source had little competition, though, does not mean that life was easy. Teeth from Australopiths that lived one million years after Lucy showed that they experienced seasonal stress in their diets. Lucy may well have faced similar hardships and likely spent a long time roaming the savanna in search of food. Absolutely stunningly, Footprints from Lucy's time have been preserved in the earth for us to study today, called the Litoli footprints. What's fascinating about these footprints is that recently, more have been discovered from the same location that suggests there were different walking styles, 
different gates, used by hominins at this time. How well australopiths could walk and run has been a big debate in anthropology, and these different footprints will certainly be analyzed for clues to the evolution of our bipedalism. Not only are the Litoli footprints an incredible relic of ancient human life, the literal footsteps of some of our most ancient ancestors, but they are also a reminder that three million years ago, humanity was very much in its infancy. There were probably many distinct groups, each subtly different, each with its own specific quirks, survival strategies, and biological adaptations. When Lucy was wandering the earth, trying her best not to starve, she almost certainly was not just on the lookout for plants. She probably had a taste for something meatier and had a secret weapon to get it. Many monkeys and apes use tools to acquire food, so it's likely that there has never been a point in hominin evolution where we were not using some form of primitive tools. What separates our lineage, hominins, from our other cousins, though, is the ability to really modify tools and improve them, particularly stone tools. It was believed for a long time that the first modified stone tools were the Olduin stone tools created by our genus Homo, specifically Homo habilis, around one million years after Lucy had died. However, recently, stone tools were unearthed that date to 3.3 million years ago, right in the ballpark of Lucy's life. These have been dubbed the Lomequi assemblage and are currently the oldest deliberately modified stone tools ever found. Bones of animals, likely ungulates and bovids, have also been unearthed bearing cut marks from an astonishing 3.4 million years ago. This evidence suggests that Lucy's diet could have been supplemented by quite a bit of meat and that she was creating tools to access it. This raises some really fascinating questions. First, how did they acquire this meat? Lucy was only about one meter tall and was not likely to be a great sprinter, so hunting large and fast animals was probably not easy for her. Could troops of Australopithecines have bullied faster predators off their kills? It's certainly possible. Troops of other primates can be highly aggressive, so aggressive that if Lucy's life was anything like a chimpanzee's, then another major challenge was probably avoiding other Australopiths. Lucy could have also been scavenging meat off carcasses of abandoned prey. Large predators like lions often leave a lot of meat on the bones, and that doesn't even include the bone marrow inside. Perhaps Australopiths like Lucy were developing stone tools to strip the bones of small slivers of meat or use them to smash through the long bones to get to the marrow. Instead of competing with top predators, Lucy was probably fending off other scavengers like vultures. The second important question is, what was going on in Lucy's brain? If our interpretation of the evidence is correct and hominins like Lucy were making modified stone tools, then it suggests something dramatic had shifted in the brains of Australopiths compared to other apes. Lucy's brain would have been a similar size to a modern chimpanzee's, just marginally bigger on average. Yet chimpanzees in studies have so far been unable or unwilling to produce modified stone tools and even seem unable to use a sharp flake to open a box containing food. So even though the change between the two skulls is small, something dramatic was going on underneath. The brains of Australopiths were perhaps being rewired. Another incredible artifact that allows us to get a glimpse inside Lucy's brain is the intriguing Makupan's hut cobble. This cobble was found in a cave in South Africa in layers dated to 2.95 million years ago that also contained the remains of Australopiths. Curiously, this rock is several kilometers away from where it would be naturally, perhaps as far as 32 kilometers. It's probably too big to be carried in by a bird, in the stomach of a bird, and the cave showed no evidence of flooding that could have brought it in. No one can really deny this rock really triggers that sense within us that likes to find faces, pareidolia. This ability is definitely not unique to us. Chimpanzees process faces in a similar way to humans. Many animals have evolved this sense out of simple self-preservation. Spotting faces ultimately reduces the chances of being bitten by them. It is possible that this rock stood out to an Australopith, that something about the rock said, Hey, take me home. Let's go back to the cave. Again, suggesting that something was really changing in the brains of Australopiths. This is especially interesting because, so far, endocasts of Australopith brains and chimpanzee brains have shown little difference in organization. So the change must have been incredibly subtle but very significant. 
Perhaps all of our artistic expression and creativity ultimately have their roots in a simple moment of curiosity by an Australopith like Lucy. Lucy was not simply an upright walking ape. She was taking the first tentative steps towards becoming human. One of the major events in Lucy's life might have been giving birth. This was probably quite difficult for Lucy. The combination of upright walking, which narrowed our hips, and slowly increasing brain size was probably starting to put a strain on pregnant women. Baby Australopiths would have probably had to rotate slightly to pass through the birth canal. This meant that giving birth was certainly harder than it had been earlier in our evolution and therefore might have become a more collaborative process. Instead of Lucy giving birth on her own like a chimpanzee commonly does, she could have been surrounded by other women, perhaps her own mother, assisting her in bringing new life into the world. Who knows what effect this increased collaboration had on our evolution? Usually, when we imagine increased cooperation in our prehistoric ancestors, we picture them hunting together, but that's just one way we cooperate, and the increasing difficulty of giving birth could have been an extremely significant factor in our evolution, in the evolution of our complex social systems. How much of a role Lucy's baby daddy played in raising children is subject to huge debate. The issue revolves around the size differences between males and females, called sexual dimorphism. In primates, species that have a high degree of sexual dimorphism tend to live in societies where there is one massive guy trying to have all the sex with all the women and playing little role in the raising of children. Silverback gorillas and mandrills are two perfect examples, absolute beasts. Compared to other apes, humans don't have a high degree of sexual dimorphism, and males tend to be very involved in the raising of children. Some studies of Australopithecus afarensis have concluded that there was a high degree of dimorphism. Others have argued that the degree of dimorphism is similar to humans and that, therefore, males were more involved in family life. In support of this idea, Australopithecines seem to have developed slower and had longer childhoods than our modern ape cousins, probably because they might have had to learn how to produce stone tools and live slightly more complex lives. So more investment was probably required from somebody, and that could have been dad. Who knows? It's just hard to say for sure because we don't have a perfectly preserved male and female Australopith, so all these estimates are based on reconstructions. The specimens we do have are not only incomplete but also separated by hundreds of thousands of years, plenty of time for a species to change. Whatever happened in the twists and turns of Lucy's life, at some point, of course, she died. She's dead. Spoiler alert. Judging from the fractures on her bones, some have suggested that she died from falling, though others contend that these fractures could have been caused by large animals. Either way, her death was probably sincerely mourned by her family. Humans, of course, grieve for their dead, even chimpanzees grieve for their dead, especially infants, even staying by their side for days. As the evidence suggests that Australopiths might have formed even closer bonds, we can only imagine the pain that they would have felt watching over her body. Little would they know we would still be watching over Lucy more than three million years later, captivated by the stories she can tell, not just of herself but of the origins of everyone alive today.